Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. I mean, it's uh, it's rather wonderful actually seeing so many people in a lecture hall at Cambridge. Um, it's uh, it's uh, two years, isn't it, since we've been able to do this, um, and it's a real treat. As well as having you in the lecture hall today, uh, we are joined by millions of people worldwide, um, as they say on the radio, uh, by the power of Zoom. Um, some introductions. Uh, I'm Martin McConnell. I um, have been chosen as the natural lead on a debate about regenerative medicine because I studied history uh, at Cambridge a long time ago. Um, but today I uh, have the privilege of running or chairing the uh, Alumni Advisory Board, which works with the executive team to try and ensure that we're delivering a great program uh, for alumni. It's been a bit of a strange year this year as we come out of COVID. Uh, we've got a, a new director and it's going to be really exciting going forward. More important than that, though, I am joined by two incredible people who are uh, in different areas at the cutting edge of regenerative medicine. On my immediate right is Dr. Michaela Stora, and beyond is Dr. Fotis Sampaziotis. Uh, Michaela, stop me talking. Tell us a little bit about who you are and, and, and what, you're, what you're up to. So good morning, uh, my name is Michaela Stora and I'm a group leader at the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute. And so what I'm really interested in trying to understand is the process of complex tissue regeneration. And so what our group really focuses on is this, uh, there's a remarkable capacity in both mice, humans and primates that if you remove the end of your fingertip, but you leave part of the nail and you don't really stitch it up, it just naturally grows back. So what my lab is interested in trying to understand is how does this occur in humans and why are we able to regenerate the very tips of our fingertips, but not an entire a limb or an or entire finger, for example. Um, so that's really what we're focusing on right now. And the overall goal would be if we can understand that this process of fingertip regeneration, we can take the, the messages that we learn or the principles and try and use these to regenerate other types of uh, tissues or organs in the body that don't normally regenerate. Perfect, perfect. That's, even to a historian <laughs> and a medieval historian at that, that's clear. Uh, Fotis, what about you? Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Fotios Sampaziotis. I am a, um, a consultant hepatologist in Adam Brooks Hospital in the Cambridge Liver Unit. So I spend some of my time working as a physician and a group leader um, in the Stem Cell Institute. It comes as no surprise that my research is related to transplantation. And what we try and do in the lab is use cells to either repair organs or grow artificial organs, which can be used ultimately in the future for transplantation. To increase the pool of organs that's available for transplantation and that's what we do in a nutshell brilliant it's absolutely clear as well I, just uh, from from my perspective i mean how did you both get interested in in i mean because you're a hepatologist how did you get interested in regenerative medicine as well as being a hepatology doctor i i think that when you work in the liver unit what you see is that Transplantation is a gift of life. It transforms someone's life. But, but after a while, you start, the fact that hits you, the fact that you can't give everybody a liver. Yeah. And this is because there's not enough livers to go around. Yeah. What we need to appreciate is that in order to save one person by giving them a graft, another person has to die. Yeah. So we need to somehow work around this problem. We're trying to overcome it. Yeah. But at the moment, um, demand is always greater by supply. Yeah. So this is how we started thinking. Is it possible to start using cells to generate artificial organs in the lab to supplement the ones we have so that everybody who needs a liver can get a liver? And the same principle can be applied to other organs. We use the same approach. Everybody who needs a heart gets a heart or a pair of lungs and so on and so forth. Yeah, inspirational. And, and for you, Michaela, I mean, how did you alight on this as, as your research? Um, I've always been really fascinated by the natural world and there are lots of animals out there that regenerate and I think this is an amazing phenomenon and so this is something I was more driven by curiosity and wanting to understand how the body works and how yeah. all these things are able to happen and so I sort of got into regenerative medicine and this side of just trying to understand this amazing uh, vessel that we walk around in and how it actually functions. Brilliant. Well look how we're going to do it today is we're going to have a few sort of sections to the conversation maybe a bit of a scene setter about 
what is regenerative medicine? And then I thought it would be a great opportunity for you to go into a little bit more detail to explain um, exactly what you're doing. Um, and then um, some follow up questions from me, but also going to the floor uh, and going to the people um, who are online as well. Um, I mean, I, I, let's let's start with, you know, where you left off, Michaela, uh, nature. Um, I mean, is regenerative medicine something that's born out of nature? I mean, how long has it been a discipline? I mean, is it is it from looking at animals that we as humans have, have, have taken up this idea? Or how, how has regenerative medicine become a thing? Well, if you really think about it, I think people have known that the body is able to regenerate for a really long time. If you look back at Greek mythology, so there is the story of Pythagoras that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, how he was basically punished by the Greek gods and he had, he was uh, tied on up on a rock. Prometheus. Prometheus, sorry. But that's, sorry, no, I'm so embarrassed. No, no, just, <laughs> sorry, I need to learn my this story in here. Why is he becoming a historian? Excuse me, here. Thank you. Um, so basically he had his liver pecked out yeah. and it, it would regenerate every evening. And so this really came from a lot of these like um, yeah. mythologies actually do come from observations of, yeah. of actually knowing things. So um, we do know now that the liver can regenerate to some degree. Um, so this is so they've known about it for a really long time as a, a modern discipline. It's probably only been around for about th three decades for about yeah. 30 years. And we've had lots of leaps and bounds really recently and we've been able to make a lot of new discoveries and actually get into actually being able to help people um, and i would say that's really in the last five or ten years that we've yeah. made all of these and, and photos i mean um forgive my ignorance on this but if it was a venn diagram regenerative medicine stem cell i mean how much is the overlap i mean how much is it, you know is it all stem cell or is it you know what it, what is regenerative medicine and how does it you know overlap with stem cell so if I want to give a broad overview of regenerative medicine, regenerative medicine, I would say we do, um, we do three things. Number one is we try to promote endogenous regeneration. To give you an example, you cut your skin. There's a big cut there. There's a tiny bit of scar. And three weeks down the line, you even forgot you had this scar there. Your skin has completely regenerated. There's nothing left to suggest that you, um, that you felt and hurt your hand a few days back. This is endogenous regeneration. In disease, these failed, and we're trying to find ways to promote endogenous regeneration, and that could help us cure diseases. The next stage is what happens if we get to this part where an organ is terminally damaged. So the organ stops being able to regenerate itself. Drugs don't work because we have sustained so much damage. Is there a way to rescue this organ? What we're trying to do then, the building blocks of an organ are cells. These cells are damaged in disease. What we try and do is replace the damaged cells with healthy ones. So we kind of refurbish the organ and give it a new lease of life. And finally, if all else fails, if the damage is such, if for technical reasons we cannot replace the cells, then the question becomes, can we replace the organ? What does that mean? That means that we need to build a lab-grown organ in the lab, well, obviously the lab is <laughs> lab grown. And then we try to take out the organ that's completely damaged and put in a new one. And this is the ultimate goal of regenerative medicine, of course, the most challenging one um, to achieve. But I mean, so uh, and forgive me, because that's really clear. But I mean, are you using stem cells here or is that, am I just getting this wrong? Is stem cells? No, it's, it's a very important question. So stem cells. Um, when we talk about stem cells, to just give a bit of context, yeah. these are cells very similar to the cells that exist in the embryo. So they are baby cells which can give rise to every organ and every cell type in the body. Yeah. So in regenerative medicine, we thought that if we, want, if, if we sort of harness the power of stem cells, we can make any organ, and that would be great. So at the moment, a lot of work on the regenerative medicine is being done on stem cells. Okay. However, we do have new technology. So if we were to say that between 50 and 70% is based on stem cell technologies, now we're doing a lot of work using what is called adult stem cells. Yeah. These adult stem cells are still cells which can regenerate naturally, but they can, they can give rise only to one or two organs. For example, stem cells in the liver can only 
give rise to liver cells. Multiple types of liver cells, whatever gets damaged, but they're not like the stem cells in the baby that can give rise to the toes and to the brain and to the heart. The liver stem cells are called adult stem cells and can only give rise to liver. So big difference between embryo stem cells, which could be anything, and exactly. adult stem cells, which are tailored to be particular parts of your body. Exactly. And there's some research now being done, for example, by the Clevers group, which where we are using even primary cells. More and more labs are finding ways to take a tiny bit of tissue and convince that tissue, that tiny bit of the organ, to expand without having to use stem cells, the same way it would regenerate. The liver is a good example. Normal liver regenerates. We can take a tiny piece of the liver, put it in a dish, and make it think that it's in the body and it's been damaged and stuff growing and growing and growing and growing. Okay. So the, these are newer approaches, though. The classic stem cells have been around for a long time. A long time, okay. And of course, you I mean you say, you know, when we cut ourselves, the skin regenerates. That's happened since Prometheus. Um, but you also said, Michaela, it, it's um, uh, as a discipline, it, it's only in the last few years that it's you know, been really sort of medically delivering, as I understood it. So, so what kind of has it delivered in the last, you know, five years or whatever? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure I know. Yeah, so there have been some amazing advances. There is a team in London and they work on a project called uh, the London Project. And this is led by a very amazing scientist, um, Peter Coffey. And they're working on trying to um, cure blindness. So there are conditions called macular degeneration. So it's where you have the photoreceptors in your eye, they degenerate over time and you slowly go blind. And they're using stem cells where they're actually able to transplant them behind the cornea uh, into the eye. And they are actually having some success with this. Um, at the moment, they haven't completely cured blindness, but people are actually getting back uh, part of their sight. So this is a really exciting endeavor. Uh, there are some other groups in uh, Italy. This was led by a scientist called Michele De Luca. Uh, they're able to take uh, skin stem cells and grow full sheets of skin in the lab, and they're able to transplant that back onto burn patients. And so they're able to actually help them and save a lot of lives by doing this sort of thing. Um, so there's, there are other examples. There was uh, one in the US uh, where they were actually able to grow an organ in the in the lab in a dish um, and they were able to transplant this organ so it was women that were born uh, with a medical condition they didn't have vaginas they were able to actually transplant these vaginas into the into the women and they were actually able to have a normal life um, so wow. it's been some really great advances that's <laughs> good sneeze <laughs> well, um, amazing advances uh, you made it really clear that it's happening around the world um, we're both, you know, you're both here at Cambridge. We're really privileged that you're part of the, the Cambridge ecosystem. What, why did you, you know, why, why are you at Cambridge doing your research rather than Italy, London, New York? What, what is it about Cambridge that that is a good good place for the research that you do? I mean, start, with, start, with, start with Botus. <laughs> that, that, that's very kind. Thank you. I think Cambridge is about the people. Yeah. It's a hub, of course, because of Cambridge's reputation, the brightest minds come together yeah and then it's about density because in all countries you have bright minds but in cambridge what we have is an ecosystem where in a very very small space you have so many bright minds in so many disciplines so a lot of the research we do is not based just on what we do in the lab it's based on going to the department of engineering and asking a question or then going to find patients in the hospital but if i'm if i hop on my bike I can get to anywhere I need to be in Cambridge with 20 minutes. So most of the time you will find me with a white box carrying our samples <laughs> around. Or now that I'm a little bit older, I get the students to cycle with me. But that is the opportunity. And then you go down in the canteen in the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute, for example, and you find another two or three profs. And you can just bounce ideas off them. Yeah. And for many other people around the world, the equivalent of what we do for lunch can only be done in a conference. Yeah. So you can imagine the differences about ideas, yeah. potential and dynamic. And it, a really, I mean, great point to hear is it's, because I know it's an important Cambridge agenda point is inter interdisciplinary. I mean, the, it's a melting pot that you can talk to people from across disciplines to, to, to do your research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes funding bodies ask us, why can't you do this research anywhere else? 
Yeah. Why can't you go and do it in the States? Why should we not fund the same research in Scotland, yeah. for example? Yeah. And the answer is because we have so many things together here. Yeah. This is the only place, I think, in the world where we can take cells from the patients, grow them, yeah. take them. There's so many pharma companies around which will help us turn them into a medical product, yeah. inject them back through a clinical trials unit yeah. or within two kilometers. Yeah. We've got everything we need. Yeah, that's that's really inspirational too. I think it'd be really great if we heard a little bit more about about your research in a little bit more detail. I mean, I'm sort of thinking seven minutes or so, just because we want to make sure distill your life's work into seven minutes is what I'm really saying. Um, I used to be a journalist. That's what we do yeah. the whole time. Uh, but if you were able um, to to take us through it, I mean, it'd be really really helpful. I might just go stand up here. Um... I can do it in five. Watch, watch. I can do it in five. <laughs> yeah. So the ability to regenerate is widespread throughout the animal kingdom, and some animals have this remarkable capacity. A great example of this is planaria. So planaria are these flatworms, and you can take a planaria and you can cut it up into hundreds of different pieces, and each small piece of this worm will regenerate an entire organism. Another remarkable example is that of the zebrafish. These animals can regenerate their fins and their tails, but probably what's most amazing is that if you cut off half of their heart, they'll grow this back as well. And some champion regenerators are that of called an axolotl. So these look like little uh, lizards or salamanders, and these animals are absolutely amazing. They can regenerate their tails, their limbs, the lens, the retina of the eye, the spinal cord, and even parts of their brain. But as you move up through the evolutionary tree and you come to mammals, our ability to regenerate is drastically diminished. But it's not all bad news. We still have some capacity to regenerate. And one of the uh, most interesting, at least for me, is that of the fingertip. So if you remove the end of your fingertip, but you leave part of the nail, so if you see through this uh, dotted line here, this will actually regenerate. And what happens is initially you'll have this wound healing response where the skin will come and close off the side of the injury. And then you have this very specialized structure termed a blastema. And this structure is made up of all of these progenitor or stem cells. And this is where all the magic's gonna happen. All these cells have the capacity to regenerate all the missing tissues. But regeneration is level dependent in the fingertip. And what I mean by that is if you remove beyond the nail, so you cut through this red dotted line here, this doesn't regenerate. So you have this capacity to study regeneration and regenerative failure in the same animal. And so why am I interested in looking at the fingertip? As Spotus already told you, the skin's able to regenerate. We know livers are able to regenerate. And the reason that I'm really fascinated by this is that it's an example of true multi-tissue regeneration. And what I mean by that is that the fingertips made up of all these different types of organs. So you're going to have bone, you're going to have uh, vessels that run through it, the fingertips made up of nerves that go through here, you have the skin, which has the outer layer of the epidermis and underlying dermis, and you also have the keratinocyzed nail. So this is the part of the nail that you have to continually clip. And so what I'm really fascinated in trying to understand is how all of these different types of cells are able to come together at the right time and the right place to regenerate a structure that looks exactly like the original. So what we're doing in the lab, and I'll just go through very briefly, is that what we've learned is it's not just the cells that are important to regenerate. What's really important as well is the type of environment that you put them in. And so what we're trying to understand is what are the signals or the growth factors that come from the environment that allow the fingertip to regenerate? Are they coming from the nail? Because we know that the nail is really important. And can we try and understand what these different factors are that allow you to form this progenitor structure, this blastema, this structure that's full of stem cells. The other thing that we're really interested in trying to understand is the actual microenvironment around it. We know that it's not just because of chemicals. There's also a really important part of the structure that's around it or the mechanical environment. So if you think about walking across a bridge, if you walk across a bridge that's made of, of bricks, you walk across very strongly, very uh, in a very direct manner. But if I put you on a suspension bridge, which is really wobbly, the way that you move across that bridge, the way that you behave will be very different. And that's exactly the same thing of what happens 
happens to your stem cells, if they're on a structure that's very hard, they will respond in one way. If they're on a very soft structure, they'll respond differently. And they receive all this information by the tissue mechanics that surround them. So we're trying to understand how that works as well. And then our final thing that we're really trying to do is a lot of the work that we do, we're looking at animals and how they respond, but we'd also like to move this into human models. So if someone has an injury at the hospital, can we take the cells when they clean up this injury, model them in a dish to understand that how they're going to respond to all the different chemicals or the mechanical environments that we see in animals as well. So that's really in a nutshell what I'm doing. So I hope I made my seven <laughs> or five minutes. <laughs> I had a, a, just a quick follow-up question, and we will, I promise you, will come to, I'm sure you're bursting with questions, but we'll hear photos first. Um, but my follow-up question is, I mean, and maybe this is not something you can answer, but you, you, you took us through those animals at the beginning where they're amazing at, at regenerating. Is it the complexity of, of mammals that has meant that we've lost some of our regenerative power? I mean, why is it that mammals aren't so good at regenerating? That's a fantastic question. There are a hundred different theories yeah. about why they why they are. Um, what we've learned about regeneration, which is really fascinating, is that there's a lot of different ways to do it, that there's not just one pathway that goes through. Yeah. And so for every reason why we think, oh, maybe we can't regenerate because our immune system's really different from an axolotl. If you look at their immune system, they hardly have much of a response at all. Yeah. But then you find that there are other examples where we've overcome this. So we've found different ways to get past the immune system. Yeah. So we really don't know about why we can't regenerate. For every hypothesis we have that it must be that this is the barrier, we'll find an exception yeah. and a way that we've gone around that. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Focus. Thank you ever so much. I'm very humbled to come after Michaela. What she does is very clever. What I do is less clever. I hope you'll bear with me. <laughs> so I've, I've already hinted to what we do. In the lab, what we're trying to do is address the discrepancy between demand and supply for organ transplantation. And to put a bit of context to that, as I mentioned before, there are times in the course of a disease where the organs are destroyed to such an extent that no amount of drugs can bring them back. And there, the only thing we can do to save our patients is change the native organ for a new one. And this process is called transplantation. Of course, as I mentioned before, because to harvest an organ, someone needs to die. There's a huge discrepancy between supply and demand. And we're using regenerative medicine that we talked about to try and overcome this problem in three ways, promoting endogenous regeneration. And Michaela has spoken to you extensively, so I won't chat um, about that. But there's also two other ways. Either try to repair and refurbish an organ by changing native cells which are damaged and diseased with healthy cells and we're going to talk a little bit about that because we do some of it in the lab or making a whole new organ or um, part of an organ but of course one can't do it simultaneously in all the organs i'm a liver doctor so it comes as no surprise that i focus in the liver and, uh, and the liver is also a big organ so i focus in a very specific part of the liver which is called the bowel ducts and the bile ducts are these tubes that you can see here in green. And they have one job. Their job is to transfer bile, which is produced by the liver, and they transfer it to the intestine. And bile is a very toxic fluid. It's very toxic because it has to help with digestion. However, the bile ducts are protected by the toxicity of bile. And they do that through a series of cells that line the lumen, like cobbles line a cobblestone. And these very bile resistant cells are called cholangiocytes. You can imagine what happens in disease. Cholangiocytes break down and they die. And when they break down, toxic bile starts leaking into the liver and doing what it's supposed to do. It is digesting it, it's eating it up, causing scarring and ultimately liver failure and death. So as I promised, what we try and do is really simple. We are trying to grow healthy bile duct cells in the lab and see if we can replace the missing cobbles in the cobblestone so that we patch up all of the holes. To put a little bit of context to that, a bit of a more technical schematic, what we do is we take the cells that we grow, we grow in the lab, the, these cobbles are called cholangiocytes, we inject them up the bile ducts, and what they do is they go on 
and patch these holes. Now, does this work? Because we hear a lot about exciting science, but the big question is, will it ever reach human? What we've done in Ademlux for the first time in the world is we've used human livers. We captured these human livers for transplantation, but in the end, we couldn't use them because we found that these livers had massive problems with their bile ducts. What we did is we maintained these livers alive outside the body using one of those machines. So this comes back to working in Cambridge and multidisciplinarity. This is a routine machine for us that we use in theatres in Cambridge. For many centres in the world, this is very um, high technology, like, like leading, leading technology. But what it does, it allows us to keep an organ alive whilst it's waiting to be transplanted. Our organs were already on this machine, so what we did is we took these human livers, we injected our cells, and we managed to repair their bile ducts, rendering them suitable for transplantation. We didn't have ethical approval to actually transplant them in humans, but this is the next step in our research, and this is the first time in the world this has been done. And this is not work that is done by us alone. This is a multidisciplinary team. And what you can see here, although you can't tell them apart, and maybe I should have put some titles, <laughs> is that there are engineers, surgeons, radiologists, nurses, and um, basic scientists who provided the cells. It's a team that makes this happen. And again, this is why it is so unique to the University of Cambridge that you have this concentration of people who can work together. And I've spoken a lot about organ repair by injecting cells. But what happens when you need to replace part of an organ? This brings us to the leading cause for liver transplantation in children. This is called biliary atresia. If you remember my initial schematic, the bile ducts form a tree and they come to a common outflow, the trunk of this tree, which is called the common bile duct. In biliary atresia, what we have is the common bile duct, the common outflow of the biliary tree is missing. And of course, there's nowhere for bile to go. These children deteriorate very rapidly and the only thing we can do is change their liver, give them a liver transplantation. And it's a shame because for two centimeters of tube, you end up changing a perfectly healthy liver in a baby, which is very high risk as an operation. So we thought in the lab that it would be very interesting to see if we can produce a replacement part of the organ, this replacement tube, a replacement bile duct to avoid these children going to transplantation. Again, I'm going to use an analogy here. We need to make a part of an organ, tissue, as we call it. This is slightly different to generating cells. Because if you think of cells as building blocks and of the organ, our tube, being a house, you need something on top uh, of, the, of the cells, on top of the bricks of a house to give it integrity and strength. You need a skeleton where you lay your bricks on. And this is called in bioengineering a scaffold. This is exactly what we've done. We collaborated with the Department of Engineering, Athena Markaki. We used a, um, a natural component of the body, collagen, which we use quite a lot. And we made a tubular structure. Then we injected our cells as we do before in this tubular structure. The cells started to grow and generated a bioengineered, a bio, an artificial, a lab grown bile duct. We tried to see if this bile duct works. We have transplanted it in mice. It worked very well. Now we transplanted it in pigs and our trials so far, they are ongoing, but are going very, very well. And this is the last step before applying for clinical trials. So we do expect to see this product in humans soon within the next um, three to five years. And I wanted I wanted to thank you for your attention and leave you with that slide saying that the point about regenerative medicine is that it's very young, it's just started, but what was science fiction 20 years ago seems to be very, very close to, um, to coming into routine medical practice now. Thank you Brilliant. very much. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Come, come grab, grab a seat. I mean, I've got tons Thank of you. questions that come from that. I mean, you, you answered one of them, which is that you don't yet have um, ethical approval for doing this in humans, but you expect to have that fairly soon. And, and, and for this to be something which is impacting human lives in the next three or five years. Yes, absolutely. And I think the regulators are very sensible. Yeah. All they want to do is see that we've made appropriate 
steps forward. We can't take something which is a concept and put it in a human without having tested it in a, in a living being yeah. to see what complications might arise. Yeah. Because we're very good at predicting things, yeah. but there's always an unpredictable factor. Yeah. And this is why it's important to test it in small animals, yeah. in large animals, um, and so on. You, you, I mean, also, you, you talked uh, at the beginning there about um, currently, you know, if an organ fails, you have a waiting list and someone has to live and someone has to, to die. I mean, it, it feels that that's an ethical question in its own right. But what, what sort of ethical questions does um, regenerative medicine raise? What are, the, what are the ethics which you have to, to, to think about here? I think, I don't know, Mikhail. <laughs> so I think it depends, first of all, on the source of cells that you use. Yeah. And um, there is a lot of ethical questions that, that were raised now 30 years ago yeah. when we started using embryonic stem cells. Yeah. These cells were originally derived from uh, aborted embryos. Yeah. So the question was, is it ethical yeah. to use this tissue? Now that we've got induced pluripotent stem cells, which come from a sample of skin that you treat with a cocktail of chemicals and you make it into a stem cell, or when we have adult stem cells, um, it is much easier. Yeah. So this, that's that's kind of disappeared, that debate, because I still have that in the back of my head. Exactly. That's, that's gone. We, we have overcome it, and we very rarely use embryonic stem cells now for right. regenerative medicine. However, other questions arise. Yeah. Questions like who will get an artificial organ yeah. and who will get a natural organ because you still have to make a choice yeah the the technique that i've just shown you sort of refurbishes an organ which was deemed not suitable for not suitable for transplantation we're discussing with a lot of patient groups yeah. from patients with bowel duct diseases saying would you opt for a refurbished organ because people might say well it's unfair how do you choose me to get a refurbished one no i want the i want the real thing yeah i want one that comes out of a human yeah yeah um you know, and so it is very, very difficult yeah. to make these choices. Yeah. Mich Michaela, I mean, anything else on the ethical side that has to be thought about this? Uh... Well, the, obviously, there's a lot of issues with you look at then it's very expensive to do this kind of thing. Yep. So then you have to look at, well, how do we decide who gets it and who doesn't based? Is it based on socioeconomic status as well? So who can afford to do this? Yes. Versus who can't? So you have issues like that. Um, but there are a plethora of them. And, and as Fodis was saying, how do we decide, uh, you know, who gets the organ as in, do we look at who would be the person who would survive the most or do we make it on, you know, and then potentially it could be life-saving for that person yeah. or could it be that person is maybe, uh, maybe not the best candidate because the chances of that actually succeeding are less. So how do we make these kinds of decisions? And who is making those decisions? I mean, how much support do you as clinicians or scientists get on these, these big ethical questions or is it just determined by what the Daily Mail is saying? No, no, we, <laughs> we are actually trying to use, well, these questions need to be based to some extent on evidence, right? Yeah. So we are trying to make algorithms that predict the chances of survival. Yeah. So first of all, at the moment, to give someone a liver, they have to have better survival with a liver transplantation over five years yeah. than if they were left without a liver. Yeah. So, there, um, uh, so, so that, that is one very, very big um, indication. Yeah. What we try to do when we try to ask the question within our transplant waiting list, who gets an organ first? Yeah. We try to look at parameters like the blood tests of the patient, how sick the patient is, to allocate the organ. And unfortunately, it's not straightforward. It doesn't mean that the sicker you are, the, the more likely you are to do well with an organ. There's a cusp. So if you get more sick, you need an organ more. But it's also less likely that the operation will, will succeed. And there's a, a cutoff where you are too sick to even withstand a 12-hour operation. Yeah. This is what our algorithms are trying to predict. Yeah. In kidneys, we are very good at allocating organs and we have very good uh, algorithms. And the kidney physicians don't have to choose which organ goes to which patient. But for livers, we don't have that. So what we do is we have a multidisciplinary meeting with the surgeons, the clinicians, all, all the hepatologists, yeah. Um, our histopathologist, radiologist, to try and allocate and match the organs to the patients. Your last slide was that very provocative time cover of 2045 and the sort of matrix thing going in the back of the head. 
Um, I mean, is that, uh, you know, when we go and see our doctors, what, how soon is it before a regenerative medicine sort of solution will be really common? Okay, so that's a very good question. So there are, um, there are a few hurdles. Yeah. When we're talking, when we're looking at, first of all, we have to do a first in human trial, yeah. which has to succeed. A first in human trial, if it were to start in three years, say, yeah. it would take one to two years. This would be a safety study, yeah. meaning that we can inject cells and we're not asking the question, do they have a curative effect? Are they actually making you better? We're just asking the question, are they not making you worse? Is it safe to have them? Do you get no side effects? Yeah. After that, we'll have to have a small efficacy trial, and this is called the phase two um, efficacy trial, which might, which might be another two to three years, following which we have to test it on a large patient group, and that could take up to another five years. Okay. So we're really looking at 10 years before it can hit the clinic, and then when something hits the clinic, and we've seen that with many, many agents like CAR T cells, for example, yeah. or biological agents that we use now for Crohn's disease, yeah. um, it takes a little bit of time to identify how we're going to deal with the cost because these are very, very expensive treatments. So usually we start with a very small select group of patients and over a period of five years, yeah. we start rolling it out whilst pharma because of course it produces more of the of the cells of yeah. the medicine drops the cost yeah so i would say it it wouldn't be before 15 years, 15 years okay that you can go to your doctor and say well there's two tablets and one cell oh, therapy one, that's it and michaela i mean because yours um photos you're a, a, a clinician or a doctor as, as well as being in research you're pure research and, you know, I looked at yours um, when I was reading on the website about you, and I love the plain English section because um, uh, it helps historians. Um, but, I mean, from a fingertip, the ambition is to understand how to, to, to what, regenerate limbs? I mean, I mean, you know, it's, wh where does this take us? I mean, what's, what's your hope and aspiration? You know, standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, where, where, where is this going? So obviously, yeah, the, the ultimate goal would be to regenerate uh, appendages, so limbs, fingers. Um, but the, it, there are a lot of other lessons we can learn from yeah. the fingertips. So it's one of the only areas where we have complete scar-free wound healing. Yeah. And so you know with a lot of different types of diseases, scars are really a problem yeah. because they make the tissue a lot more rigid and that can cause adhesions, that can make your organs stick together, things like that. So if we can find uh, lessons learned from this. Why are you able to uh, heal a tissue without any scarring? You can apply that to other areas as well so that would be something else that we're very interested in understanding not just how do we regenerate limbs or fingers as well that's fascinating it's brilliant i i feel like it's with the light it's hard to see everyone there and i just feel like i could talk to you myself for the next sort of hour but that would be very very selfish so um what, what i'd like to do now is um to invite questions from the floor now uh, there are a couple of uh helpers who are going to go around with microphones um it may feel pointless having a microphone it isn't because Although we might be able to hear you, we want to capture what you're saying for the people who are uh, watching this uh, via Zoom. So, uh, again, where should we start? Uh, well, Vic, yes, that lady there. Thank you. Hello. Uh, a question for Photius. With transplants, uh, the rejection and the amount of effort and money goes into rejection is quite high, the cost of that. With the repair, repair by stem cells, if you use the same stem cells from the same patient, does that actually minimise the uh, probability of rejection of repair on the organ? Yes, absolutely. That's a very, very good question. Um, we feel that if we're going to repair someone's native organ using self cells, which are called autologous cells or stem cells, which are coming from the same patient, overcomes a ton of ethical issues because first of all we're not worried about giving an infection that we missed from one patient to the other and 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 second as you very rightly pointed out when we give when we transplant an organ which is not our own we have to give immunosuppression these are long-term medications very costly many many side effects however if you were to inject your own cells to your body after you take them out repair them 
expand them, then that means you would have no need for immunosuppression. Not only would you avoid transplant and keep your own organ, but you would also avoid all these medications with the long-term side effects. So this, a big part of what we're doing is looking at that and thank you for bringing it up. Superb question, thank you. Rachel, we've got someone down here. I was um, very intrigued by you saying that you could grow, I think, a whole liver in a lab. Well, we can't grow a whole liver, we can grow a whole bile duct. So, the, uh... so you, you, so, ah, right. So, because um, I was just going to say, when you grow a liver, presumably there's all sorts of different structures and different cell types in that liver, and you can't quite do that yet. Is that right? We're part of a European consortium, which is called the Regenerative Medicine um, Consortium for the European Association for a Study of Liver, where we're working exactly towards that. Um, there has been a lot of progress, but we're not quite there yet. And the beauty of the liver is, as Michaela said before, is it regenerates. So you don't actually need to generate a two kilogram organ, thank God. All you need to do is generate 10% of that. That's the critical, that's the minimum mass of liver you need to have. So you just need to generate, well, I don't think justice. Just. <laughs> that's a justice, but uh, 200 grams instead, which is more compatible and, yeah. and feasible to do in the lab. And this is an effort where a lot of labs from Europe are coming together and we participate with a bile duct. We should say when livers grow back as well, what's interesting is that they grow back just as a mass. So they don't look like your liver that you had before, but they're functional. So that's really amazing. That is amazing. Amazing. Next question. Uh, I know it's one down here. Victoria, that lady there. I've just brought a, <clears throat> a cutting out of the Metro, which says Frankenmouse is created out of stem cells in lab. And, and this refers to a lab in Cambridge. I mean, could this be applied to human embryos and what are the ethics of this scenario? I think the, the Franken mouse was when they had like transplanted an ear onto the back of a mouse from what I remember of that article. Um, is, is that the one you're talking about? Okay. <laughs> It, it, gives, it gives the name of the, um, the lady, Professor uh, Zanika Gertz. Is she part of your team? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she should be. <laughs> but I mean, how many people are working across regenerative medicine in, in Cambridge? A lot. A lot of people. We can't give you a number. Yeah. But we have, we have several groups because although in each organ, there's maybe a couple of us working. There are so many organs. Yeah. So I would say more than 10 groups for sure. Okay. And how often does this phrase Frankenstein, you know, get thrown at you? And, you know, what's the reaction to, to scientists to that now? I don't think we, we get it too much, uh, yeah. to be honest. Um, what's interesting when you're talking about embryonic stem cells, we are very cautious about using them now. We used them at the beginning, but we have found that if you place them in an environment, particularly in the uh, adult body, they can form teratomas. It's a type of, of tumor, and it's like an embryonic tumor where it starts to form teeth and bone and all sorts of things like that. So we're very cautious about using embryonic stem cells now, that if you don't really restrict them or, or make them um, um, sort of be a little bit more committed to going down a particular lineage, it can be very scary. And that's why I think we've really moved away from using embryonic stem cells, also apart from the ethical issues, and trying to use adult stem cells or try and convince other stem other cells in our body to sort of go back and become a bit more plastic. So I don't think we'll be going quite down that route, but thanks for the question. But also, if I were to add here, there's very strict rules about how you use stem cells in the lab, not only embryonic, because you are always worried you don't want to start creating an embryo in a dish. So you're not allowed to use them after a certain period of time. Um, and you are definitely not allowed to do, um, there's a lot of very, very good and very rigid rules about what you can do with human tissue. Well, as for the animals, sometimes what you see is what we call ectopic transplantation. And we don't do it for the fun of having a mouse with an ear on its back. Yeah. It is because it is much easier and much more humane for the animal if you transplant a piece of tissue to see if it vascularizes or if it's alive when it's in its back rather than cutting it open twice a day yeah. to see how things things are going. So although it seems it's a it might seem at first uh, past that it's a cruel thing to do. It's actually quite more humane. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Christian uh, Martin. Yeah, let's throw the one there. Yep. 
there, and there are lots of questions. We'll try and get to as many as we can. And I'm aware, Vic, there's a lady down at the front who wants to ask as well in a bit. So, Thank you. Um, I actually broke my back whilst as a student here at Cambridge, but luckily had no spinal cord damage. But when I was recovering in hospital, lots of the patients obviously had injuries that would never heal. And I wondered if in your team, Michaela, in particular, you were looking at spinal cords and why they don't repair in the way that other tissues do. And the sort of fingertip examples seem quite interesting for that. Uh, in mine, we're not actually looking at it at the moment. There are some fantastic researchers looking at that. Um, there's Robin Franklin's group, Thor, who unfortunately isn't here, uh, is looking a lot at spinal cord, uh, or she did some work on it. There's Alison Lloyd at UCL. And what they actually think happens, it is, it's a scarring issue. Basically, they make these scars that the cells are not able to migrate over, and therefore they can't fuse back together and start to regenerate the spinal cord. So they're trying to get rid of these fibrotic bridges. And if you can get rid of that, then the cells will have a chance of being able to join up and potentially regenerate. So that's an area that is ongoing. Maybe it's something we really should look into because it is fascinating. And yeah. Thank you. It's been uh, incredibly interesting. It was just a question on your, um, your, your bile duct. You said you moved from a, a mouse to a pig and then hopefully into a human. Do you have to use mouse cells for the mouse and pig cells for the pig, or can you use the same type of cell all the way through that study? So because we're using immune, the, the reason to, for using mouse cells in the mouse and pig cells in the pig is because you get a rejection, which means the immune system of the pig recognizes that there are some cells there which are not its own. And so what it does is attacks them and tries to kill them. And this happens in humans when we put a different organ. The way to overcome that is by using immunosuppression. Because we want to test the functionality of human cells, all of those experiments were done with artificial human bile ducts, but we used immunosuppression so that they are maintained in the, in the cells. Otherwise, the regulators are going to very rightfully say, well, you've proven that a mouse bile duct works, not a human bile duct works. So, Great. Any other questions? Uh, yes, one there and one here I've seen. Uh, thank you very much. I found it very interesting. But in my diary, um, it was noted as a talk by Sir John Gurdon as well. And um, he is acknowledged as the father of stem cell research with a Nobel laureate. And having spoken with him, I know that his research on this is very far advanced uh, with ethical approvals and to patent level. Um, and he hasn't been mentioned. I just wondered if you knew anything of what he's achieved so far. His work is phenomenal. So he was one of the first people ever to um, basically take a, an egg and he was able to enucleate it. So basically, uh, you've just got the shell of the egg. He was able to take the DNA from another, um, another animal and put it back into that one, and he was able to transplant. And so he had um, an egg that had a completely new, re was able to reprogram the original donor using the DNA from another, another animal. And he is absolutely the father of, of stem cell genetics and that, and he's absolutely amazing. He's still working in the lab. I had the privilege of being able to interview him about six months ago. Uh, still at the bench, still doing uh, experiments himself, and he's absolutely amazing. He wasn't able to tell me at the time what he was working on because of the patent, um, but yeah, he, he's still an absolutely amazing scientist. So he's really looking at how you can reprogram cells, so you can use the DNA from one um, animal to another and actually get that DNA to override that and, and tell the cell to become something else. So he, he's absolutely so incredible. So the father of stem cell. Absolutely. And he and I'm, I'm just amazed. Like he's such a cognizant man. He's still at the bench doing the research himself. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's a wonder to talk to. So. Superb. Well, maybe for next year we'll have him. And there was, a, Rachel, a question here. You mentioned uh, 15 years between uh, discovery and approval. Uh, given the uh, we're an audience of a certain age, um, uh, and post-COVID, where they speeded up the whole process of approval, do you see that that may have an effect or there is, are there possibilities where you could speed up that process? Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I have to be, um, I have to make a small correction here. 15 years is not to get approval. 15 years is to hit the shelves. So it is to be, you know, mainstream 
treatment years, yeah. for patients. But but of course that doesn't change the 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 fact that that in order to get this treatment would still be 15 years. Other ways to to um, to speed it up, absolutely. First of all, there are selected patients, and we're looking at that in collaboration with King's College. That means when a patient has no other option and they're going to die anyway, despite anything you can offer them, it is possible, and this is called a transplant in a named patient, to get ethical approval to try a new treatment that's supposed to be working. So we're definitely exploring that. And the other thing is, for example, in biliary atresia, which was the leading cause for transplantation in children that I've shown you, this, is, this has a specific designation as a rare or orphan disease, as it's called, because it has no treatments. So again, you get an accelerated ticket there. So for that particular indication, we expect to be much quicker because there are no um, alternative therapies. So it's a, it's a very good point. In, in certain indications, it will be quicker. Are there any other questions? I can see one up there and, and one here. I think we'll probably make those the last two, uh, just in the interest of time. So the gentleman there, yeah. Um, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. So really a question for Dr. Storer. Um, and following from the um, story about broken back, around 10 years ago, I cut three fingers off with a circular saw, which was successfully reattached by Professor Gus McGrather and his team at University Hospital South Manchester. Now, one of the interesting things was that over a period of several weeks, feeling developed and I was told that the nerves were regrowing into the fingers. What was happening there, please? Yeah, so basically um, it will put down pathways so that it will put down tracks and the nerve and you have something called swan cells, which will come out of the bit of nerve that is left. And these cells can migrate in and then they can actually start to form new neurons in, in your fingertip. So you will regain your sensation. So that, that's, uh, that's fantastic. It's amazing. I'm happy to hear that it, it was successful. Yeah, delighted to hear that for you. And, that, and Rachel, there's that someone here. Um, I was just wondering, in a lab, how long it takes to grow regenerative um, cells and, or even 10% of a liver? That's a very good question. It's, it's what we call um, a manufacturing question. This is what pharma comes and asks mm -hmm. us all the time. They say, we want to make this, but how long is it going to take? Yeah. So. If you, if you think of the cells, it's like a baker's oven. So what you do is you, in the morning, so when you take cells from a patient, you turn up the oven and you wait until it heats up and you start putting the first loaves of bread in. This is when your cells start growing. You just took a biopsy from the patient and your cells are growing to reach a critical mass. This will take about two to six weeks in some cases. But once your cells have grown, what happens is every time you can take one dish and as they grow, they almost grow out of the dish. What you do is to let them grow more, you remove the cells and you redistribute them very sparsely. It's like seeding in a garden in five or 10 dishes. Mm -hmm. So once they've reached that critical mass, every five days you can split them, as we call it, and get 10 times the amount of cells that you want. So then what you do is you tailor the amount of cells that you keep as your maintenance, the amount of cells that are growing to be split every day, to to the amount of to the demand that you need to meet, and you keep a tenth of those cells in culture. And every five days, because of the rate at which they grow, you can gain a tenfold uh, return. So once you've to uh, give a simple answer to your question, once you've established the cells in the lab, you can generate adequate numbers every five days. I, I, just before I bring it to a close, I mean, we've got tops five minutes, but I wondered, was there any question from the world of Zoom that um, we'd, we'd miss? So, no, I think that's it. Is there, is there anything, you know, any parting word of wisdom uh, from either of you that you want to share? I mean, you know, what's, what's your hope and ambition, you know, Michaela? What, what's, you know, you go into a, a lab every day, what's a good day look like, you know? A good day looks like um, just being excited and curious about yeah. what we're doing. Um, you know, I really love when we work in the lab, we work with a lot of undergraduate students yeah. and PhD students. They're super enthusiastic about what they do. Uh, it's always exciting. You, you'll find if you actually work in research, 90% of the time, everything fails. <laughs> um, it's just one of those things where you, you try and there are those few re eureka moments where you yeah. find something new and unexpected. And most of the time when you do discover something in the lab, it's, um, it's not what you thought. 
So it's never like, oh, yes, we've discovered it. It's usually, oh, that's a bit odd. Yeah. And then when you look into something that isn't what you expected, that's when you find some really amazing um, things that move you forward. So versus what's what's a good day for you? I think a good day for me is when I see that spark in the students finding something new. Yeah. I have to be honest with you. We are in research, you're like an athlete. You've got a few good years yeah. when you are really clever, really yeah. on the ball. And then you become very experienced and you have a lot of technique, but you're not nearly as clever as your students. What we do yeah. is a drop in the ocean. What will be the good outcome, outcome of our career is we, if we enable 10 more minds to come out of the lab because they will make a world of difference compared to what I will ever be able to make. So the best day in the lab for me is when I see the students happy, when they come back to me with an idea, or when they tell me that something that I say is silly and it isn't going to work, and this is how I should do it. Well, that's a fantastic uh, note on which to leave it, both of you. I, I'd just like to say thank you very much to, to the audience here today for uh, the brilliant questions and the engagement, but a really massive thank you to Michaela and Fotis. I found that absolutely fascinating and um, wonderful to get an insight into such amazing, you know, planet-changing research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.